Uh, guten Abend, guten Morgen, guten Tag. Ich begrüße Sie. Well, good morning, good evening, hello. Let me welcome you for this second panel of our conference. After the Haitian case, we're now focusing on the case of Moria, the refugee camp near Moria on Lesbos that has burned down in the meantime has become a symbol of the misguided refugee policy of Europe. As part of the EU-Turkey agreement, it has been declared a hotspot for accelerated asylum processes. But like in the hotspots in the other eastern Aegean islands, this system of quick processes with deportation to take or redistribution in other European countries has failed. Instead, many people are living in miserable provisional camps for months or years without knowing how things will go on for them. And the responsibility is pushed this way and that between the EU and the Greek government and local government. It looks the same in the responsibility around the camps. Often the responsibilities are unclear or diffuse. It's hardly possible to tell who is responsible. With the presence of UNHCR and aid, organization, aid organizations, this hasn't changed. Crowding, uh, lack of medical supplies, uh, care, and a lack of legal advice and bad hygienic conditions, and a precarious security situation still determine the everyday life of people. And this is not the consequence of lacking resources. Billions from Brussels and Athens flew, flowed into Greece. Moria seems to be becoming a business model at the same time. The dependence on aid is increasing, being placed in a decent housing, being moved to the mainland, or So uh, it will depend on vulnerability. So people are negated as subjects of law and are reduced to objects of humanitarian help. In a mushy conglomerate of uh, migration management, security policy and charity, nothing, hardly anything is left of human rights, spaces without democratic and Legal structures are emerging in which the aid regime is taking over control along with the security system. What does this mean? If uh, refugee camps are becoming the source of new experience with violence, how can it be that uh, Donations are sought with the keyword of Moria without improving the situation. How are NGOs compensating the failure of, con of governments on the outer borders of the EU? And what needs to be done in order to counter the disenfranchisement of refugees? I would like to discuss this with Shirin Tinnesand and John Siegler and Maximilian Pichel Shirin works for Stand By Me Lesbos, who supports refugees in Old and New Moria, and she does research in Norway on the role of international aid organizations in refugee camps. Maximilian Pichel, sitting next to me, studied law and political science at Frankfurt and was the law responsible for law on pro asyl He works on critical law theory, refugee law and migration law and police law. Among other things, he focused intensively on the EU-Turkey agreement. John Siegler is a sociologist. He was the UN rapporteur on the right to food and is on the UN Human Rights Council. We went to Moria together two years ago, before it burnt down. And John Siegler wrote the book about this, The Shame of Europe. And we invited him as the author of this book. I'm very glad that all three of 
you are connected now uh, or sitting next to me and I would like to give you an opportunity to speak now. We've just heard it from Mark Schuller and the others on the Haitian panel to what great extent this island has become dependent on international aid. Mark Schuller put it that aid was the second disaster after the earthquake and we're observing something similar. Shouldn't you have been living on Lesbos for some time? You know, old Moria before the fire and the new one after the fire. Many say it's even worse. You're working with people who have to live within the camp and you see how aid organizations are really falling onto this island without improving the situation. Has aid in Moria failed? me to speak first of all um, when it comes to the aid industry in Lesbos actually what we're seeing is that uh, it's thriving uh, if anything is actually overachieving um, I mean the camp has some of Europe's most uh, expensive showers we don't it's still even to me it's unclear it's how many showers there exist in the camp but there should be uh, bucket showers there consisting of 5 million euros and uh, if we're looking at um, how how much uh, money has gone into it. Uh, if we compare it with Turkey, then 6 billion euros was given to Turkey to 3.6 million uh, Assyrian refugees. And Turkey is actually the country that is hosting uh, some of the most uh, refugees and asylum seekers in the world right now. Uh, compare it to Greece, uh, where there's been 3 billion euros just in state support and around half a billion uh, given into NGOs for roughly 250,000 refugees. So then we're looking at 1,700 euros for the asylum seekers in Turkey compared to 14,000 euros per head uh, of a refugee and asylum seeker here in Greece. So there's clearly uh, a difference happening here. And what is happening here? That's what we need to look at. So um, the way that we're seeing is, is that everything comes down to two points. The first point being is that this whole situation is being dealt with as if it is uh, a humanitarian crisis, but it's not. It's a political problem, and that is also how it should be handled. Um, so what would happen if we evacuate the camp tomorrow? Well, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people would lose their jobs, their income, and I mean, everyone that has been here is just some sort of an accomplice in it, not necessarily ill intention, but we're all kind of profiting from this misery um, in the way like even myself, either we're profiting from it financially, I'm not doing that, but I profited from it through networking. If I hadn't gone to Moria a year ago, I probably wouldn't be here on the panel. So to me, that's also a sort of profit. And that is kind of what is going into that. That's at some point, Moria turned into this almost being like a Californian gold mine that uh, there's lots of ways to profit from it. Uh, and it's all happening at the expense of the rights of the asylum seekers and the refugees. Uh, so I will go more into that now. Um, so, like I said, you can kind of go down to it. To a, First thing is that it's being handled as it, was, as it was a humanitarian crisis. This opens a lot of doors. Uh, it should have been handled as a political problem, and then these doors would have been closed. Um, and everything else that we're seeing around it, like was mentioned in the introduction about the uh, depoliticizing processes, is kind of symptomatic to this. So with it being handled as a humanitarian process, uh, NGOs has almost been mushrooming and they started coming in 2015 and in 2016 so actually mm. most of them are quite young then of course looking past you know msf but most of them are quite young and there is an unprofessionalism that is following with that i mean just going to their home pages a lot of them are missing uh, basic things like uh, financial reports like activity reports 
even addresses or ways to contact them. Um, another thing is what is happening on, on the ground uh, with the NGOs. So uh, just to stress, NGOs is also playing a role. It is not only EU, it's not only UNHCR, it's not only uh, these actors, also NGOs is, is playing into it. Um, so like I said, in, in 2015 and particularly in 2016, um, a lot of these um, NGOs came on the ground and they were producing this image that we need hands on the ground. And anyone can come. Just as long as you can, you have hands, you can come and you can be useful. Uh, to some extent in 2015, this was true. But in 2016, the situation changed. Um, so what we're having now is that we're having this image that anyone can come, but more as a reception center. If, if you're uh, as an asylum seeker or coming to a reception center in Germany, you would be met with psychologists, you would be met with social workers, but that is not the case in, in Germany. And I find that really strange, but that's also unfortunately part of what is happening with NGOs here on the ground. Um, and I mean, the people are entitled to have professional aid. Like to give an example, if, if I'm going to a doctor, uh, then I want to get cured. I don't necessarily want help. I want a cure and I want a diagnosis. Um, and then I don't want the doctor to sit and, and cry as they're giving me uh, my diagnosis. I, I want to know, okay, it's a, it's a tumor. What can we do about it? And that's also something that is coming with professionalism because it doesn't feel good when people are giving you pity. I mean, people who have experienced things, they, they know what they have experienced. And this is, to some extent, it's not really... Um, following through with their dignity and that, that they should be met with. And a lot of the people who are coming here as volunteers, I also experienced, doesn't have, um, again, talking about unskilled ones, not the skilled ones, but they, they don't have any background um, knowledge about which people they're about to meet, the cultural differences, how to tackle what uh, they're meeting here. Um, so I find that very strange. And there's another image also um, being produced by the NGOs, at least in my experience. And that is this image that asylum seekers and refugees are uneducated, that they're not able to, to do what they should, like this basic task, very simple task, and that they need help with it. And all in all, um, the NGOs are profiting from it. And I know I'm, I'm working in an NGO myself, but this is what we're seeing, that NGOs are profiting from it. Um, as a volunteer, you're coming. Uh, there's rumors. Um, I heard a rumor that as a volunteer coming here with some of the NGOs, you need to pay a thousand euros just to volunteer with them. Maybe the, the NGO will have houses or cars that they will rent to them as well. And I mean, for the house that they're renting, this would actually be a higher price uh, than it will be on the local Greek market. So there's not that much money going into the Greek local economy. A lot of it is going into the NGO. And on top of that, maybe they're encouraging you to fundraise on top of that. So they are profiting from it. So what are the Greek government doing about this? Well, what we're seeing is that there is an inability or um, an unwillingness to monitor this, to monitor the money, to monitor the people coming. Um, for sure, there are unregistered NGOs who are working inside the camp still. For sure, there are uh, people who claim their NGOs, which are not actually an NGO per entity, who are also working in the camps. And what are, kind of standards are they having for the volunteers who are coming? Again, I'm not trying to say that all volunteers are bad, but there needs to be some level of professionalism. These are the most legal, weakest people that we have in the society, and they're dependent upon the care and protection that they get from the Greek government. So the Greek government cannot simply just put that over on non-governmental entities. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately, because they cannot guarantee that their rights are being upheld. So when they're not monitoring uh, specifically who's coming, it's very, it's highly plausible that sex offenders, everything has come through these channels uh, with intentions that doesn't exist in this environment and doesn't fulfill the right that they have. Um, and I mean, another way of seeing that is 
This is also very strange. Like with the images that we've been seeing now in January, with the camp being completely flooded, um, I mean, there was a construction company that was on the way. But in the meantime, these tasks were given uh, to non governmental entities to fix, for example, the problem with drainage. And if I'm hiring a plumber in my house and the plumber company are bringing unskilled and unqualified personnel and on top of that, not even the right tools. Of course, I would, I would be skeptical. Um, and uh, while they're kind of building and trying to fix it, every time it rains, my house is leaking again and everything I own is being leaked and my property is being damaged. What would I do about that? Well, first of all, I would get them out of my house and then I would probably take them to court for damaging my property. And this is exactly what we were seeing in January, that there was unqualified uh, and just were put to the task of fixing the drainage system. And they were bringing shovels instead of bringing a scavator, a scavator to fix the issue. And all of their items were being drenched every time it was raining. Um, but the difference is that um, they cannot take the NGO to court in the same way that perhaps we would. And this is kind of also calling upon accountability that is difficult when the depoliticization process is happening. It's difficult to call upon accountability because you don't necessarily know who is accountable for the errors in the system. And I mean, another thing also that we're seeing with this is that very often there is a tendency that uh, asylum seekers and refugees should accept things that we ourselves wouldn't accept. For example, um, after the old camp burned down and they were put into a temporary camp, uh, the first thing that happened was that what we understand as a temporary camp all actors were flocking to it and looking for ways to prolong what we see as a temporary camp. Why are we trying to prolong this and make it long term? We are already understand that it's temporary. And also the conditions inside, uh, what is deemed acceptable uh, to us is not is on a lower level for them. I mean, if there was an earthquake in Germany, Germans would never accept sitting in a tent camp and not having any options to shower for over two months. And when they do get the option, it's bucket showers and you're expected to fill up a bucket with 10 liters of cold water and then go to an open air frame and shower with your neighbor. A German would never accept that. But for some reason, an asylum seeker should accept that. So what I'm really calling for with all of this is that if we're going to change the situation, then we can't feed it. We, we have to change the structures of how all of this is working. And we have to, instead of talking about how many showers are available, how many toilets are available, we have to direct the debate onto the fact that refugees' rights are being withheld, that refugees' rights are being violated, and that this needs to be handled as a political problem. Thank you, Shireen, for sharing this look at the insanity that is Moria. This is um, something that a lot of people have not looked at. Criticism has been voiced as regards politics, but as for what was happening as regards aid supplied in Moria hasn't really been in the limelight. Thank you, Shireen, for giving uh, us this insight. Max, question to you as a lawyer. How is it that Moria as a system can continue to persist? Clearly, refugees' rights are being violated. Why is it so difficult from a legal point of view to go against that? Well, thank you for the invitation. I believe you don't have to have studied law to realize that life conditions in the hotspots have not been compatible with human rights for a long time. They don't have access to health care, education. Their freedom of movement is restricted because with the imposing a duty to reside there, to stay in place. And that shows um, the general strategy of the Central European uh, governments that they have pursued for 20 years now, a policy of systematic outsourcing. On paper, European asylum law is supposed to be preserved, but in fact, refugees are denied access to the asylum process. And that makes or has made the Greek islands camps of injustice and disenfranchisement. In my paper, I would like to give 
a number of reasons why so far it has not worked to do something about this system of disenfranchisement also in courts and in the legal system. First of all, and that ties in with what Shireen has said, this narrative that Moria was a humanitarian disaster prevents the rights of refugees from being brought to the center of the debate. Secondly, there are very high de facto barriers in the European legal protection system that make it difficult for lawyers and legal aid structures to challenge what I would call the Moria complex in the courts. Regarding item one, Shireen has already commented on that. Uh, Considering the rights of refugees is important because in the narratives about Moria, that hardly plays a role and the responsibility of governments for the conditions on the islands hardly play a role. The inhumane living conditions are considered as a human humanitarian catastrophe, as an exception or an accident in operations. And when occasionally refugees are redistributed from the islands, as after the fire in September 2020, the governments of the EU member states often justify their actions by alleging quick help and moral humanitarianism. Let's remember what the German government did and what the German federal chancellor and Ms. Merkel said, and the Interior Minister Seehofer, after exerting or after massive pressure from civil society, they ended up reassigning refugees. But they painted a picture of a supposedly generous reception, and that blurred out the fact that for years the German government had been disregarding the rights of refugees from the islands. For refugees who already have family members in Germany under the Dublin III regulation, under European regulations, have an enforceable legal right to enter Germany and to continue their asylum process here. Yet the German government systematically has been blocking these procedures, preventing family reunification. Such existing rights and legal entry routes would have to be strengthened instead of relying on voluntary assistance. To do that, you'd first have to overcome the narrative that Moria is a purely humanitarian disaster. So responsibilities clearly have to be identified. The responsibility of the EU, which has enforced the hot spot approach on the islands, also in connection with the Turkey agreement, and they're active there with uh, the European Asylum Agency and Frontex. Um, the European Union significantly supported and pushed the EU-Turkey deal, is blocking legal routes for refugees, and the responsibility of the Greek government uh, that is running the camp and does nothing to change the inhumane conditions. And as Shirin has said, the responsibility of some private aid organizations that, through their questionable commitment, is, are propping up the camp system rather than criticize it and overcome it. My second point concerns the problem of why there is little that can be done to counter this disenfranchisement on the islands. Even German Chancellor Angela Merkel said quite openly that it had been known for a long time that people live there in undignified conditions, but why can't it be changed? Actually, refugees have a whole bundle of rights that oppose the conditions on the islands. Uh, the Geneva Refugee Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, and the European Reception Directive grant them freedom of movement, access to education, and decent housing housing, adequate health care, and fast asylum procedures. And of course, we can all see that in reality, none of this is working. And it is especially against the backdrop of the corona pandemic that we have to r remind everyone of the European government's responsibility to protect human life and health. Now, these rights could be enforced before the European courts, before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg or before the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. However, for the right to be effective, it must first be mobilized. So uh, it, th this right will not happen by itself. Uh, legal advice is required, resources are required for access to litigation, and all lawyers and uh, legal system structures on site also say that those are the problems that it is not possible to uh, have all the resources to take all these claims and to litigate. And you also have to look at what the courts have been doing. The Court of Justice of the European Union early on 
uh, said that lawsuits against the EU-Turkey deal were inadmissible, and the judges claimed that the EU member states of the European that the EU member states had not acted in their capacity as European institutions when the deal was struck with Ankara. With this ruling, the European Union Court stripped itself of its supervisory role and gave the member states a completely free hand in externalizing migration controls without constitutional restraint. Now, however, to go through the European Court of Human Rights, it is this is complicated to do if your aim is to systematically review living conditions on the islands. Every complaint brought in Strasbourg is, first of all, the complaint of an individual. Now, in urgent legal proceedings, time and again, it has been possible to pave the way out of the camps for refugees. Only this automatically ends the proceedings to fundamentally clarify which rights from the European Convention on Human Rights are violated in the EU hotspots. The Greek government has also shown itself adept at clearing cases of fundamental importance off the table as quickly as possible, for example, by paying compensation to those affected. The goal is to prevent any major proceedings from being opened in Strasbourg. And finally, each individual case consumes a great deal of human and financial resources, even if a case is won in court, because then the problem of putting the verdict into practice often only begins. The Greek government and the camp managements try to use every means possible to circumvent court rulings. The European Court of Human Rights three weeks ago, in fact, um, allowed a trial of eight refugees from the four camps on the islands and sent questions to the Greek government. And although this represents an interim legal success, it is still not possible through this procedure to hold the EU itself responsible for the conditions on the islands. After all, Greece would be sued, and once again, Greece would be punished as a proxy. And even if the European Court of Human Rights were to find conditions contrary to human rights in a judgment, such a decision is probably not to be expected for another three years. And the judgment would then concern a situation that no longer exists. And it would denounce conditions in camps that no longer exist because the situation is already changing on course. A closed center is supposed to be built, and the new reception center on Lesbos is to be built on the outskirts of the island, right next to a garbage dump in an area where the local population is not likely to pass by, where there will be even less publicity, and where there will be hardly any access to legal advice structures. It is all the more important to repoliticize the conditions on the islands. The Moria system did not perish with the fire of September 2020. It persists. And the Moria system is not a European operational accident, but it is the logical consequence of an irresponsible externalization policy and a systematic disenfranchisement of refugees by the European Union. Thank you, Max, for these uh, legal explanations. Jean, I would like to pass the floor to you now in your book you wrote that with the undermining of the right to asylum and the blatant violations of refugee rights, the EU is destroying the foundations on which it itself was built in 1957. Now, Shireen has just described the state of aid on Lesbos, and Max has pointed out the limits to legal action against rights violations. What is going wrong politically in Europe that places like Moria can exist here permanently? <laughs> Well, what I've heard so far is highly interesting, and I fully agree with what has been said. But what's behind this policy? Who is really responsible for these dreadful and inhuman conditions with barbed wire around the refugees on Lesbos, Samos, and the five Greek islands in the Aegean Sea? Those who are responsible is the European Union, and the European Union, especially the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, she says refugees are a threat to the European way of life. In March of last year, concerning the conflict at the Evros uh, border river, she said in Athens, 
She thanked the aggressive Greek police who really clubbed down people, and she said, you're the protection of Europe. And as Max has said quite rightly, all means are used in order to undermine the universal human right to asylum. It's really undermined and removed. People are taking their own life, lives. Others are mutilating themselves because their applications for asylum are not processed. The right to asylum is denied, and the rights to asylum and human rights are the foundation of the European of the European Union. Uh, the claim of the European Union is to be a continent of the rule of law, but by really removing the right to asylum on the southern border, really closing the southern border with Frontex, with this uh, border guard of the EU, and uh, by funding the Greek border uh, patrol. They're practically funded by the EU for hunting people at high sea. The pushbacks in order to not allow the refugee boats to, 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 to approach European coasts. So that uh, the refugees could even claim asylum, so the pushbacks and the inhuman conditions at the hotspots. This situation, this policy, is a deliberate strategy of deterrence of the European Union. Why is there this strategy of deterrence? It would be completely wrong, of course, to say that Ms. von der Leyen and the commissioners in Brussels, the executive of the EU, are cynical people who bring about inhuman conditions. There is quite a specific reason. There is a specific policy which gives reason to this strategy of deterrence, and it is this. Everywhere in Europe, there are racist and xenophobic movements that are making progress. They exist in Germany with the AFD, the Lega in Italy, and the Front National in, in France, probably the uh, strongest movement, a completely racist movement in France, and so on and so forth. And the conclusion of the European Executive of the Commission is the scapegoat theory. This is the line of argument of the xenophobic movement of, of Le Pen, for example, in France, or Salvini. They tell people, you're doing badly in precarious uh, working conditions, threatened by unemployment, and whose fault is it? The refugees, the foreigners, especially the refugees. And the EU executive concludes from this, if you want to stop this movement, and this must be done, this uh, movement must be stopped. If you want to do so, they say, the numbers of refugees needs to be, need to be reduced, even by completely illegal means. And the credibility of the EU is undermined by this. This policy of uh, violating human rights and this analysis of the EU executive of the Commission is wrong. It has been contradicted by history. A racist and anti-Semite, an anti-Islamist, a racist is an enemy of humanity, and you cannot enter into any compromises with them. You can't accommodate them, uh, uh, thinking that they would become less racist or less aggressive. That's wrong. You can't do this. This is a complete error. Racists need to be fought against. 
using all constitutional and democratic and peaceful means that are available to our countries with the rule of law. You must not enter into any compromises with these movements. If you just reach out a small finger to them, they'll take the hand. If you reach out with your hand, they'll take the whole arm. As I pointed out in my book, there's only one historical comparison. Let me put it this way. In 1938, Daladier, the French Prime Minister, and Chamberlain, the English Prime Minister, got to Munich to see Hitler, and they told him, OK, Czechoslovakia belongs to you. You can integrate the, the Germans in the Reich, but please, let's not have a war. And Hitler said, great, I agree, that's it. And Chamberlain and Daladier went home to Paris and to, and, and to London. And Chamberlain brought the famous sentence of peace in our time. Hitler destroyed Czechoslovakia, integrated the ethnic Germans, and made war in Poland immediately. As I said, you cannot enter into any compromise with racists. And this is why the strategy of deterrence that the EU is using is completely wrong. The right to asylum is a universal human right. Human rights are universal and indivisible and interdependent. You can't treat them separately and say, well, if we bring about human conditions in, with uh, hygiene and food and medical care to the refugee camps, then this would only attract many more because the situation would be better many more would come, so this is called the pull effect. A pull effect, it's called, and this is an argument, this is the second point, this is a, an argument which is completely intolerable because a human right, like the right to asylum, is a, is a right that everybody has who is persecuted or bombed within their own country. They have the right to cross the border and to ask for protection in a different country. And if you want to quantify this right to asylum and say, well, for the first 10,000, we accept this and give them protection. But uh, those who come after this, the human right will not apply to them anymore. But that's impossible. You cannot quantify human rights. And in addition, when you look at quite practically, as the UN High Commissioner Filippo Grandi recently said, if you took all the people to be expected that via Croatia and Herzegovina and so on, and the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean, who want to come to Europe, you would have to expect about 50,000 people. And the European Union, the 27 countries, have 482 million, 482 million people living there. So even if all the people to be expected were to come, it wouldn't be a problem at all integrating 50,000 people in a demographic pool of more than 480 million people. So this argument of the pull effect, that you need to maintain deterrence so that people in Syria and in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in South Sudan, in Darfur, decide not to come because the news from these uh, camps uh, are so terrible because the conditions are so dreadful that people would not come. This strategy of deterrence is a complete negation of all human rights, not just to the right to asylum, but also to food, 
to health and so on. It's a negation of the foundation, in fact, of the European Union. of all human rights, and in, it, in addition, it's inefficient. If you are a person who has uh, children living in Aleppo, or where there was this bombardment of the mass murder in Putin, and you have these children living, and, uh, and you're in this bombed area, then you go away. No matter what the news are from Karatepe, the successor of Moria. So all this deterrence, all this strategy of deterrence of the EU, which is intended, the hell of Karatepe today is intentional. It's deliberately organized like this. In addition, there is Greek corruption since 2015. Greek, Greece has received more than 3 billion euros for the Iraqis from Brussels. Brussels. And all this uh, strategy of deterrence in terms of international law is an offense. It's an offense and it's politically inefficient and Humanly, it's completely unacceptable. And let me say one more thing, if I may. The 27 countries, the 27 states, have the rule of law. We're not pow powerless in democracy. This is not so. Each one of us is responsible for these dreadful conditions at the hotspots and for the human hunt in the Aegean Sea and in the Mediterranean. Each one of us is responsible, and each one of us has the means, the constitutional means, the means in the German constitution, in the French constitution. We have these uh, uh, means. We just need to bend down and take up these constitutional arms so that we can force our governments to bring about a radical political change in Brussels, to bring about a policy of hospitality, of taking in, of uh, giving uh, a legal hearing and of uh, granting the right to asylum, to implement this, to implement this specifically. And this strategy of deterrence needs to be, uh, needs to be liquidated immediately, needs to be liquidated radically. The hotspots need to be evacuated, and the prisoners, the tortured and uh, persecuted people, need to be distributed according to the distribution plan of 2016. They need to be distributed across the 27 member countries. And there are some xenophobic Eastern European governments like Orban in Hungary or the Poles and the Czechs, who are still negating this distribution plan, they need to be held accountable and the subsidies that they keep on receiving from Brussels should be cut for them. It depends on us. There is no possible irresponsibility for any of us here. Thank you very much, Jean, for these very clear words. I'd like to follow up with a question. We've heard a lot about um, intentional or not so intentional failure of the European Commission of aid organizations. The legal system is reaching its limits. But there's also UNHCR, who hasn't been mentioned yet. The United Nations have an institution that is supposed to protect the refugees, they were active in Moria. They helped build the new camp, probably on contaminated ground. What's going on there? What's going on with the UNHCR? Max, maybe you could take that question. Well, yes, 
UNHCR really has a very clear mandate, which is that the rights of refugees on the basis of the Geneva Convention have to be defended vis-à-vis uh, -vis the nation states. And just last week, they gave out a press communication and severely criticized the pushbacks at the European borders after recently the European Court of Justice came up with a judgment. And now there are a lot of reports, though, coming from the Greek islands, from other NGOs, from scientists and journalists. Just recently, the Isabel Jayani from German WDR our uh, public broadcaster also commented uh, that UNHCR was part of the problem, not only part of the solution on the Creek Islands. And you may wonder why that is the case. I believe there are a lot of levels or layers to this. Now, in general, we, of course, are experiencing a crisis of the human rights-based system globally, and that is reflecting uh, reflected in the work of UNHCR, because UNHCR's power basically is just borrowed uh, in the form of um, funds coming from the governments and with authoritarian uh, actors so, or players such as Trump, Bolsonaro, and those in the European Union uh, coming up, uh, that also threatens the very basis UNHCR is working on. And as part of that, they are also pushed into a competition with other aid organizations competing for uh, donor uh, money and uh, also the management of such camps, which really shouldn't be uh, their task. For This is something I believe we've known for decades. Camps, camps are always places of disenfranchisement, systematic disenfranchisement, where refugees' rights cannot be upheld, and someone who is committed to the Geneva Convention ought not to be reproducing such a, such a system, but rather help in overcoming it. But HCR is enmeshed in all these crises, these problems, Plus, it is in competition with the International Organization for Migration, IOM, that is uh, experiencing more and more support from uh, the uh, nation states. And um, they're not so much uh, committed to uh, to this. Uh, they rely on uh, voluntary uh, returns. So that is um, putting UNHCR in a dilemma. There are other reasons, too, why UNHCR is now um, playing a questionable role. Um. Thank you, Max. Jean, two years ago, we were on Last Foss together. You uh, came, went with a small delegation of Medico and Pro Azul, and we spoke to a representative of UNHCR. What is your opinion uh, on this? What's going wrong reg as regards the UNHCR? Sorry, we can't hear you. We can't hear you yet. Can you hear me? Yes, now we hear you. In my book, The Shame of Europe, I describe this. There's an audio problem. Unfortunately, Jean, I'm not sure what the reason might be. Where's... Let me wait and see if I can hear something. Can you hear me now? Do you want me to go and get someone? Is it any better? I just heard you, but then you were gone again. Okay, maybe I'll ask technical support. Now? Okay. So about that that encounter, that was the head of the office um, in, in Mitilini, of the High Commissioner. That's what I also describe in my book, The Shame of Europe, little translation of the German title. And we spoke about food supply and the distribution of food in Moria, which is now being continued in Karatepe. The Greek generals, after all, Moria was uh, um, a military area, and it's the Greek generals, the Greek military that 
it takes care of the food supply for the refugees. So in very specific terms, it's about the catering agreements with large private sector companies uh, on the Greek mainland in Athens, etc. They conclude those agreements and they bring the food to Mytilene every day and then uh, they truck it over to Karatepe. And they take the food there for thousands and thousands of refugees. And frequently that food can cannot be um, absorbed. It, it's it's not it's inedible basically. The chicken, the fish all smell. There's a stench. Uh, refugees spend two to three hours waiting in a queue in the rain, in the snow. They right away throw that food away because it's inedible. So we spoke with the head of the office at the time. And she's a UN mid-level bureaucrat of the High Commission. And she said, we're aware of that. It's corruption. The Greek generals conclude these catering contracts and they take a commission and whatever money is left is then used. So corruption really is a major problem, she said. But she said, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't do anything about it. And that's just so wrong. And for that reason, uh, the attitude of Philippe Grande, the High Commissioner, as Max just said, the, the, it's the mandate of the High Commissioner that the Geneva Convention of 1951 regarding the rights and upholding the rights the High Commission does not feel responsible. They're not living up to their responsibility in the hotspots, in the in Samos, in Karatepe, and so on and so forth, in the in, in very horrible situations, barbed fenced wire. But the term that is mentioned is the principle of subsidiarity, and it is true that in the statutes you do find this principle anchored. So they say, what someone else can do, we don't do. What a government can do, we don't do. What a group of governments can do, what member states can't do, we will not do, as the office of the UNHCR. And it is also true that they have a great number of employees. The budget runs to 6.5 billion euros. They have immense responsibility ranging from Bangladesh to Ethiopia for millions and millions and millions of people on the run. And this principle of subsidiarity, subsidiarity is called upon to justify the irresponsibility, lack of responsibility of UNHCR on the Greek islands. But that's not acceptable. That violates uh, the law. He's, P Filippo Grande is not right at all here, because the principle of subsidiarity really only applies if someone else, in fact, makes sure that the Geneva Convention is complied with human rights, right to health, right to education, right to hygiene, right to food, to water, and so on and so forth. So only if and when uh, that is actually being put into practice and protected, and that isn't the case, as we have just again heard today. It's not the case on the Greek islands. And that is why it is not valid to refer to the principle of subsidiarity. The UNHCR is not living up to its responsibility. It now must fulfill its responsibility. And that must be ensured by exerting pressure on them. The 51 Geneva convention was signed by all the EU member states and basically uh, 
all governments worldwide. And we, now we, let me go back to that. I'm a bit pedantic, but I'm a professor after all. That's what we're like. We have to, it's down to us. As members of the United Nations, our mem we have to exert pressure on our very own governments to make sure that these governments in the Administrative Council of uh, the UN exert pressure on UNHCR, on the High Commissioner, to make sure that he finally fulfills his responsibility in these hot spots, in these terrible, terrible camps. That that are reminiscent of concentration camps. And finally, the High Commissioner must live up to his responsibility and to address the situation in these camps. Must be it must be rigorously ensured that the rights of the suffering refugees are upheld. Thank you very much. We just have a very few minutes remaining, but I believe we might be allowed to take a few more. And I'd like to use that time to ask a final question and also involve Shireen one more time, who is familiar with the situation from having been up close. Now. I'd like to talk about the topic of solidarity, because after all, that's a term that not only we are using here, um, placing it at the heart of our work, but so does the European Union's Commission. Last year, briefly after the old camp had, been, had burnt down, they presented a new package and they said uh, something like Moria is to never happen again. But in fact, the package very much focused on the expansion of the camp system and what the EU Commission considers to be Solidarity means that those countries not willing to receive refugees as opposed to support others in deporting their refugees. So, Jean, what you uh, reminded me of was a historic example. You, in the past, once said you can't do politics with racists, and that's heading in this direction. If you make concessions to uh, governments who are not willing to accept um, refugees, and then you end up even calling it solidarity. So, let's come to a conclusion also touching on this topic of solidarity, this new EU and migration package, what is that supposed, what will that mean? It's supposed to be a paradigm change regarding the Moria system and what could uh, true solidarity look like, solidarity the way we want to live it. Now, I don't know, I'd like to have, let Shireen have the final say, so maybe I'll start with you, Max, for the time being. Well, I believe Moria never again. It's just not true what the EU Commission said. This pact on migration is something that ultimately will make camps like Moria the rule rather than the exception. And I believe, um, I'm not even sure if they have a major plan of not wanting such camps. The EU does have a problem with constantly being confronted with such images having been taken on the European continent. but. The system here is not having a plan on how to deal with refugees. They uh, no longer comply with the obligations that they once signed off on regarding the rights. And uh, these camps are a result of a lack of com solidarity between the member states. And what I believe we will see is that these systems of disenfranchisement will be more ubiquitous. They will um, crop up at external borders. That's nothing new. Uh, we've had that massively uh, in uh, the 2000s. But one major problem is uh, the more disenfranchisement occurs along the borders and the more closely you cooperate with authoritarian regimes such as the one in Ankara or in African states, the result of that is not stability, which is what you'd want politically. On the contrary, you undermine your own obligations and at the same time you're supporting authoritarian uh, regimes outside of the EU and you may even be causing more uh, reasons for, 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 ref, for, um, f for flight. Thank you, Jean. So maybe Jean, one more comment regarding the new EU migration pact? Well, the compact of 2020 is a complete scandal. 
The problem is, in 2016, the EU came up with a relocation plan, a distribution plan, and these dreadful, these dreadful deterrence camps, these camps can only be evacuated. They can only be evacuated if you can distribute the refugees across the whole EU, across the, all the 27 member countries. The so-called relocation, reco relocalization, and each country depending on its demographics and economic power, would have to take in so and so many refugees. Poland would have to take, and Hungary and Slovenia, Croatia, and, and so on. They refuse to carry out this relocation and to take in any refugees, and I wrote in my book, the Prime Minister of Poland, he said publicly, we won't take in any refugees. We need to protect the ethnic purity of the Polish nation. These are Nazi uh, statements, the ethnic purity. And now there's the commission, the president Ms. von der Leyen, and she says, well, if they are not taking in any refugees, then at least they should pay for the deportation of those refugees who will not be granted asylum. And this is a complete scandal. If the xenophobic governments in Eastern Europe and in Central Europe are refusing to implement the relocalization plan and to accept it, then sanctions need to be taken against them. The cohesion fund should strike them from its list. You know that the by far biggest fund of the EU out of the 12 funds is the so-called cohesion fund disposing of billions of euros, and most of the governments of these Eastern European countries, these xenophobic governments, are living off this fund. And last year, five Eastern European countries received 82 billion euros from the Cohesion Fund for their infrastructure and so on and so forth. And these subsidies need to be cut in legal terms. This is certainly possible. So the action must be, these subsidies must be cut until they become reasonable and accept the relocation so that they accept any group of refugees that is assigned to them. This is an obligation, and if they do not heed this, then the billions from the cohesion fund need to be cut. They must not be left out of their opportunity as the new compact intends to do. This is a scandal. This is a ratification. This is an acceptance, a legalization, if you will, of a xenophobic behavior which is absolutely impossible in terms of human rights and international law. Thank you. Shireen, let me ask you then what the EU means by solidarity does not mean being solidarity with the refugees. How, what could solidarity look like in Moria and Karatepe and around Karatepe? To backtrack uh, a little bit, uh, in the 1950s, after the Second World War, and we got all of these institutions focusing on rights, uh, uh, rights-based approach. Um, by then, refugee camps were mainly driven and operated by camp government, and you know the government that asylum seekers had come to, UNHCR, and uh, asylum seekers would have the agency of doing what they could themselves out of their own ability. 
um, NGO is the whole thing about NGOs was something that came later. I mean, this is something that blossomed late 80s, 90s. Uh, this not to say, just to clarify, that's not to say that NGOs are bad or that they're not helpful, but in this case, what we're seeing is that they're inexperienced. Um, and having good intentions doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean that you're having an effective output. Uh, so that's kind of what we're seeing a lot is that people are very eager to help in the camp. They want to help, 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 help. And then um, they don't ask questions until after they've been helping, if it, it was a good type of help. Um, and to some extent, it, it's kind of too much. It's too much help. And in general, I don't think people want to be helped. <laughs> um, people want to receive help, but not at the expense of their dignity. Uh, not at the expense of their own ability, not at the expense of their own agency. So first, you need to make sure that all of this is covered and what they cannot do, of course, receive assistance. Um, so what we're doing in Standby Milesos is actually kind of reclaiming this idea of, of 1950s and putting it back into practice. Uh, when we started up in, in March, they came to us and they said, we want to do, but we're not... We're being blocked. Can you aid us? Can you assist us? So it was in the vacuum of there having been a lot of conflicts, run-ups in Lesbos, and it was in the vacuum of corona uh, coming that a lot of the aid organizations actually disappeared from the camp. And in this vacuum, self-organizations grew forth just like they did during the Arab Spring. And of course, a lot of the people in the camp have a history of being in countries where organizing can be difficult. So when they get the opportunity to do that, of course, they want to be part of it. And they're not doing it for us as an NGO, they're doing it for themselves. Um, they're reclaiming their own identity and reclaiming their own agency by doing for themselves and for the others in the same situation for them. Um, so from the start, the two um, main things that we wanted to do was one, uh, aid with a platform where they could speak self. Not me speaking on their behalf, but that they had a line out, a platform out where they could speak to the media, where they could say what they were feeling, where they could say, this is what it's like to be in this. I mean, I have knowledge of this situation, but I've never experienced it. It's not, this is just repeated knowledge. I didn't feel it on my body the way that they have done because I didn't live it, but I have the knowledge of it through what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling and what I'm being told. So there is, of course, a difference. Uh, so one, speak self. The other thing being to do self. Um, what we're seeing now, like this all started up in, in March. So in less than a year, they're now taking care of the garbage, not only in the camp, they're also taking car care of the garbage and waste management outside of the camp. Um, they're taking care of recycling. Every day, 15,000 bottles, which they receive from food line, are going out. This means less rats in the camp. This means less diseases in the camp. This means less smell in the camp. So actually, there's a lot of additional benefits. And they see it as their duty to try and help their community. And there's a lot of pride, even if they're out just picking up garbage. There's so much pride in it because they're keeping each other safe. And they, I mean, they're sitting there all day. They got nothing to do. So for them to get this pride feeling of I'm keeping my community safe is such a boost. So this is, on, I mean, it's boosting the self-empowerment, boosting the self-agency. There's a lot of benefits to it. They're also doing education inside the camp. We're providing uh, teacher training. So they're doing community schools inside the camp, highly compatible to do that. And they're also doing distribution. Some of the biggest distributions we've seen in Moria 2 has been conducted solely by asylum seekers. So the myth that they're not able to do themselves, it needs to be debunked because they are highly capable to do these things. And our role in this as Tanmay Meles was because they are partners, they're individual partners. They're not under us. They're not our teams, individual partners. It's that we facilitate and assist them with the tools and with the things they need. So when they see their limit, it's being communicated. And then we will fill those gaps. But the center is on them. They should do whatever is within their capacity. Um, and also, I would like to go back to the UNACR, if that's okay. 
Um, so the UNHCR is not seen as a trusted um, actor inside the camp, which is very understandable. Uh, right now, 7,000 people are facing winter. And on Thursday, they reported minus four. It gets cold. We've already had two snow blizzards here. Um, fortunately, it hasn't hit the camp as bad as it's been hitting Lesos and other areas. But already now, we've seen two blizzards and the temperature is about to drop. There's warnings in the local media that, like, please stay out, keep on these type of things. But 7,000 people are sitting in this camp and they don't have heaters. Something as basic as something to, to heat. And this is happening right now. And the other thing being, the old camp, it burned down. <laughs> and yet you got all of these UNACR tents with their logos on. And actually the UNACR tents are standing too close. There's a fire hazard with how dense the tents are inside the camp. It's too close according to UNACR's own protocols. And it's too close compared to the fire hazard. So everything is being recreated. So the... the <laughs> The only positive thing so far is that we're seeing that people in the camp are given more agency, agency to do. But beyond, besides that, there hasn't really been any improvements in, in the new camp, unfortunately. Thank you very much indeed, Shireen. Thank you very much, Max Pichel and John Ziegler. I hope that we have been able to contribute a few new aspects concerning the Moria system. There's a lot of reports on the media on Moria and many other hotspots. There are many other refugee camps we don't know anything about, but even about Moria we've learned new things, and usually it's shocking new things. However, there is also solidarity being lived there, and Shirin has reported about it. I'd like to thank all three of you for having participated, and I hope this will be a useful conference for all of you and further useful work on the reconstruction of the world can be done.